Thank you for joining us today for our SPIRES information session for developing in government restricted municipalities. Um, I think it's going to be a great session. Perhaps a lot of you are familiar with Aspire already, but this session will also talk about those kind of added um, incentives and added things that you can get by working in one of our GRMs. Today. And I am going to transfer over to our Senior Develop Community Development Director, Diana Rogers. Diana. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining us today for our Aspire information session for developing and government restricted municipalities. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to welcome you. Um, as Caitlin said, I think you're in for a great session today um, to really talk about how uh, to support development uh, in the government restricted municipalities, utilizing a tool that is a part of the Economic Recovery Act. And before we are uh, joined officially, um, as you see, Nat is on the screen, but before he begins his, his portion to provide the overview of the Aspire program, I did want to uh, briefly talk about um, NJEDA, talk about the Economic Recovery Act, and talk about my role as the liaison between NJEDA and the government restricted municipalities. And so for some of you, um, you, you may have had experience already with EDA and you may know um, what EDA does, uh, but for others of you who are uh, possibly new to NJEDA, uh, we are the principal agency for driving economic growth uh, in the state of New Jersey. And basically, what does that mean for everyone across the state? It means that we work with um, a diverse range of stakeholders and partners uh, to create and implement initiatives that will drive the economy. So we are looking to work with partners on job creation, supporting small businesses. When we have um, issues like the pandemic, we, uh, we are working to ensure that dollars are getting to large and small businesses so that uh, people are still employed, businesses remain open. So we are supporting economic development and community development across the state. And so one of the things that you should know is understanding what those economic priorities are. And so the governor um, in coming in uh, as governor wanted to make sure that New Jersey was investing in people, investing in communities, making sure that the state was a state of innovation. We wanna make sure that New Jersey is that state that folks are looking to across the country and looking at what we do um, in terms of how we support our businesses, how we support job creation in the state of New Jersey. So we wanna be known as that state of innovation. Um, but we also wanna make sure that we're doing it in a way that government is working better and working smarter. And so those are our economic priorities when we do the work that we do, when we create initiatives across the state of New Jersey. We want to make sure we're investing in people, investing in communities, making sure that we are the state that's known for innovation, and making sure that we're doing it in the best way possible. Part of what that looks like is the creation of the Economic Recovery Act. And so um, in January of 21, the governor signed the Economic Recovery Act uh, and what that did was create eight new programs for the state of New Jersey, for developers, for businesses, investors, um, and municipalities to be able to take advantage of initiatives and incentives that are available for them to look at how we can support those economies across the state. And um, today, one of those programs we are going to be talking about is the Aspire program. Um, and then as part of the Economic Recovery Act, um, what, was, what, what occurred was the government-restricted municipalities were created as a result of that. Um, and with the creation of the government-restricted municipalities, and if you can go to the next slide, uh, it was uh, the government, the ERA called for an individual to be able to work with the government restricted municipalities. So we have the city of Trenton, 
we have the city of Atlantic City, and we have the city of Patterson. And they were designated government restricted municipalities because of their need. Um, they are ve three very unique cities uh, in the state, but they all kind of share some of the same um, things in terms of, you know, uh, being able to levy taxes, having uh, a significant portion of their land area that is controlled by government. And so because of their need, they were identified and designated as government restricted municipalities. And my role as the senior community development officer is to support them in making sure that they are able to take full advantage, next slide please, full advantage of the Economic Recovery Act. So in terms of connecting them with the resources that are available, uh, making sure that those resources are targeted directly to uh, these three municipalities, making sure that the economic priorities that we outlined earlier um, are uh, being implemented and that they're being realized in these three municipalities, as well as connecting municipal officials and their developers, invest investors, and business owners to other resources that may be available. So if indeed um, there are uh, opportunities where individuals want to develop or want to bring business to uh, these municipalities and say, for instance, EDA's uh, products don't um, necessarily fit or they're not the ideal fit, then it's my role to also make sure that we are connecting those developers, municipal officials, investors to our uh, partner agencies across the state. So whether it be an NJRA, whether it be DEP, uh, Department of Transportation, DCA, we are making those connections. So that's my role, as well as to provide technical assistance and support. So um, as you listen in today, as you listen in to understand um, Aspire, also know that we are working very closely with these municipalities. So if you have projects uh, that, you know, you're you're either working on now or projects that you plan, uh, please make sure that you reach out to us, whether it be myself or Nat. And so right now I'm going to turn it over to Nat so he can really help you to understand the um, Aspire program and how the Aspire program is working. And so Nat, I'm turning it over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Diana. And thanks to all of you to, for joining us today. You know, Diana has uh, already emphasized that one really important part of this is, is sort of availability and accessibility of herself to all of you as a resource. I want to emphasize that as well, uh, that, that we in the Aspire program as well, my colleagues Deirdre Malloy and Kevin DeSmet are available all the time to answer your questions about the program. Uh, and I wanted to let you know, you can contact me directly at the contact information that is being shared right now. Um, you can also reach us uh, at the email address, aspire at njeda.com. Uh, and that will go to our uh, uh, our email inbox and we'll be able to, to, to respond to any of your questions about a specific project, about program details, uh, about whatever it is. And we understand we're, we're going to be able to, to scratch the surface somewhat today. Uh, there's a lot more. And um, the in-person conversations are really important, especially as we start to get to the details of, of, of individual applications. I also wanted to let you know that there is a program webpage which you can consult uh, during the presentation, uh, after the presentation at njeda.com forward slash aspire. And there we will have more detailed versions of the uh, PowerPoint presentation that you're seeing today, uh, links to the rules, links to a, a PDF of the application uh, so that you can review all the materials that are necessary elements of an application, um, the program map, which we'll show you and go over. So there's a lot of resources at your disposal, both uh, to inform yourselves and also to reach out to us to begin to talk. And so uh, with that, I'll just give a, a brief overview of the Aspire program. Uh, as Diana mentioned, it's a element, one of eight programs enacted under the Economic Recovery Act in 2020. And it's the successor program to the real estate support program, uh, the ERG program, the Economic Recovery and Growth Program, uh, which had preceded it. Uh, Aspire has many similar uh, 
uh, it, it behaves in very similar ways to the ERG program, has a few different features we'll touch on today, but basically it's a gap financing uh, program uh, using tax credits to help projects that uh, that have a gap in their capital stack that don't meet a uh, a market uh, supported rate of return for a project uh, to help you know overcome high costs or low you know uh, low rents in markets uh, to to support those projects and especially in the places that are strategic from our point of view around the state and in the GRMs in particular. Um, I should note it also supports commercial and residential growth, and there are a couple of aspects of it that are also important um, to make sure that the state is getting a return on the investment that it has made, and we'll go through that in more detail in the subsequent slides. So the first thing uh, I just want to cover is the resources that are available to the program, and so over the six years of the program, uh, the first six years of the program, there are $1.1 billion a year in tax credit award authority. That cap is, or that award authority is shared with the Emerge program, uh, which is the job recruitment and retention uh, program as well. So uh, it's not all for Aspire, and there's a couple other pro smaller programs that also have some claims to that overall pot, uh, but it's a substantial amount. Uh, there are um, separate subcaps for North Jersey and South Jersey as well. There's 715 million a year available for North Jersey and 385 million a year available for South Jersey. So um, in terms of, uh, you know, while projects are, this is not a competitive program in the sense of having to get a score to, uh, you know, to show that you're better than other, pro other projects. Um, if it ever gets to the point that we are oversubscribed, um, those are, ceilings that you would have to you know that we would be uh, evaluating projects within and that would be that would be our, our ceiling um, for a basic aspire project uh, the tax credit award can go up to 45 percent of project costs for most projects um, one of the bonuses of being a project in a, a commercial project in a grm is that you can go up to 50 percent of project costs there um, and if you're a project that has up to uh, that has low income housing tax credits as part of the financing, you can go up to 60% of project costs as a ceiling. Uh, there's another Aspire program element, which is called the Transformative Project a Program, which is uh, for much larger projects. Uh, these are projects that have a minimum cost of $100 million, and there's some other details that we'll discuss uh, later in the presentation. Um, but that's a uh, 40% of total project costs that are available in that. Uh, the tax credits are issued over a 10-year eligibility period, beginning with um, the, the project certification and the issuance of a temporary uh, certificate of occupancy. Um, and another key feature of the program is that uh, project developers need to pay prevailing wages for all construction and for all building services uh, during the eligibility period. Uh, last Interesting um, element of the pro of the Aspire program is that projects with cost more than $10 million need to have a community benefits agreement negotiated with the uh, the chief executive of the of the host municipality, which basically means the mayor of the place where your project is located. Let's go on to the next slide. So I'm going to cover four topics here. We're just going to talk a little bit more about award sizes, discuss some of the eligibility features some of these fiscal and resident protections and then the transformative projects. So again, this is a little bit of a recap, but just have it be the only thing on the page so it really stands out. Um, the tax credits that we can issue for, again, for the generic uh, Aspire project is up to 45% of project costs, up to a cap of $42 million in tax credits. One thing I do wanna make clear about uh, the tax credit award is, again, it's a ceiling. The other thing is, the 42 million is the amount of the tax credit. So what that would actually equal in terms of uh, being brought forward to the present day um, in terms of what you can bring to project support project construction is going to be less than that tax credit award amount because those tax credits are going to be issued um, beginning at the period of tax, uh, the temporary certificate of occupancy that is going to be anywhere from you know two and a half to four years after the actual award is made um so 
and they're going to be discounted when they're sold and you're going to be discounted back to the present value. So a $42 million tax credit award is going to be somewhat less than that in terms of present costs in, in construction. So sometimes we talk about percent of project costs, just making sure that everyone understands that the, that the, the tax credit numbers are slightly different units than the project cost numbers. Um, the, as I said before, one of the bonuses of being located in a GRM is that for a commercial project, you can receive up to 50% of project costs instead of 45. Uh, if you're a low income housing tax credit, as I said before, you can get up to 60% of project costs uh, as an award. And if you are located in a qualified investment tract or government restricted municipality, uh, or municipalities with MRI score, scores that qualify, you can also receive up to $60 million in tax credit awards. So there's another bonus, not just in terms of the percent of, uh, uh, of project costs for the commercial, but also in the total amount that's available to applicants. So uh, what are the uh, tools that we've put on our website that helps people understand eligibility? I mean, it's you know clear today we're talking about uh, about GRMs and GRMs are eligible uh, as long as their projects are conforming with all the other uh, eligibility rules. But uh, this I just did want to talk briefly about the because a lot of the folks on the on the call today are developers who are going to be developing in GRMs and in other locations in the state that. The geography of eligibility is any place in the state that's in planning area one, any place that is in the Atlantic City Aviation District, which is outside of Atlantic City in South Jersey, anything that is in either the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey Port District in Northern, North Jersey or in the Port District of South Jersey. Uh, and you can see that uh, delineated in the map um, on the screen. And then other places that are in planning area two or in a designated center that are within a half mile of a rail transit station or a ferry stop or a transit uh, hub, a transit terminal, uh, or a high frequency bus stop. Um, a high frequency bus stop, I should emphasize, is something that is defined and certified by New Jersey Transit. Um, that is going to be defined by, and there are different standards for North Jersey and South Jersey, and we will be putting information on our website that tells you applicants what that standard is, um, but we're not able to map it because we don't, we basically need to do that on a case by case basis. So anyone who thinks that they have a, a project that's going to be within a high frequency bus stop uh, should reach out to us or reach out to New Jersey Transit and get kind of an official uh, certification designation uh, and kind of a review of that, of that bus stop and your geography. Um, one other thing I should just uh, note is that film projects uh, under the Aspire program can be located anywhere in the state. Um, and I also just want to draw people's attention to the link that is below the map so you all can look at the map yourselves, use the tool and you know enter your project information in you know project address into the map and you can get a report on which uh, specific geographies that are, you know, part of the Aspire program, like whether it's in a qualified investment tract, whether it's in an enhanced area, uh, whether it's in a transformative area and so on. So and it's just want to make sure everyone is aware of this online tool so that you may think you're in a place, this is a, you know, in a qualifying place, this is a tool that can help you uh, determine that for yourselves. So for eligibility, one of the other um, important benefits of being located in a GRM for a residential project is that the minimum project size is lower to qualify. So most projects around the state that are going to qualify are going to need to have at least $10 million in project costs. Uh, projects that are located in uh, uh, either Newark or Jersey City need to have a project total project cost of at least $17.5 million. If you're in a GRM, though, the minimum project size is five million, so it's a lot easier for projects to 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 qualify for the Aspire program. Uh, one exception I just want to make is that there are locations within Newark and Jersey City that are in qualified investment tracks, uh, incentive tracks, and so in those places in Newark or Jersey City, the five million dollar minimum uh, will apply. For commercial projects, uh, 
the standard doesn't change depending on where you are in the state. There's a minimum size of 100,000 square feet. So just to remember, as you're thinking about this, the eligibility for commercial projects is in terms of square footage. The eligibility for residential projects is in terms of uh, dollar value of the project. Let's talk about transformative projects uh, for a moment. As I said earlier, these are uh, projects of uh, at least $100 million in uh, cost. Um, the tax credits that you're el eligible for for this is up to 40%, up to $350 million uh, in tax credit awards. Um, there is no limit to the total number of transformative projects in the state other than the $2.5 billion in award authority that is set aside for uh, for transformative projects and the limitation to two transformative projects uh, per uh, at most for any municipality in the state. Uh, if you're going to be a commercial project, there's a minimum square footage size of 500,000 square feet. If you're a film project, it's, it's less than that. It's 250,000 square feet. Um, and it can be, the, the, again, the, I'll, I'll, you can see the words on the screen. Uh, if you want to check whether a project is in the transformative area, use the mapping tool and it will um, it will clearly indicate whether you are or you, you aren't the transformative. Um, eligibility area is a little bit broader than just the Aspire uh, project area or eligibility area, and there are no geographic limits at all to film projects. They can be anywhere in the state to qualify. And then one other aspect of transformative projects that uh, that people should be aware of is that um, the minimum project size for a residential project is a thousand uh, units, but you can also have a mixed use transformative project that has a hundred thousand square feet of commercial space. And again, one of these things that makes it easier to develop a transformative project in a GRM is uh, a lower number of residential units required to meet the minimum of eligibility. So it's 100,000 square feet of commercial and 250 units if you're in a GM or GRM. If you're in an enhanced area, it's 350 units in addition to the 100,000 square feet. And if it's any other place in the state, 600. So again, this is one of those adv uh, advantages to being located in a GRM. For commercial projects, uh, that are uh, that are mixed use. Um, again, the minimum fi the five hundred thousand square feet. Uh, uh, sorry, the commercial projects. I think I've already uh, gone through the details for those. The one thing I did want to mention is that um, fifty percent for a transformative project that is primarily commercial, no more than fifty percent of it can be for a retail um, use, which we have. Uh, defining a sort of point of sale uh, based, and that includes restaurants, it includes anything where the sale is happening, you know, at, at the location as opposed to sort of an office use or some other kind of use. So as many entertainment use, uses might also fall into that same uh, category. So uh, that is the conclusion of the, of the high level overview of the program. The one thing I wanted to say, I, a couple of things I did want to mention again, um, there is a, for any project that has a residential component, there is a minimum 20% affordable housing component. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, there is also the requirement for prevailing wages to be uh, paid for all work related to construction. And then also all building services that are, <clears throat> that are uh, purchased by the, the project developer, the project manager over the life of the, of the eligibility period, which is the period when we are issuing tax credits to, uh, to app successful applicants. Um, Want to be clear about building services. Those are not the same things as, you know, if you have a retail tenant, um, you don't need to pay the ice cream scooper or prevailing wage uh, and, you know, that th those wages are separate from the wages that are paid to uh, people who are doing HVAC maintenance and janitorial services and those kinds of uh, services. Um, but so, the, you know, there has to be, there, there are going to be some cases where there's going to be need to be some attention paid to the distinction between those two things. Um, and then also the last point I wanted to make about community benefits agreements is that uh, the first order of business for any project is to take care of the project economics, to make sure that it can stand on its feet. If there are resources available 
under the caps that are relevant to that project um, in terms of the percent of project cost and the total dollar value of, of tax credit awards. Um, we are also using the program to make available up to 5% of project costs to projects to help resource the community benefit agreements that are uh, a requirement of the program. And the last thing I would uh, just mention about the community benefits agreements, we can talk more about this in the Q&A, is that um, we have no rules or expectations about the projects in terms of what community benefit resources are spent on. Uh, we do have some, uh, some, some process rules about uh, the consultation with the public that needs to happen, um, the timing um, and submission to us of commitment letters from a mayor's committing to, to negotiate in good faith uh, on the negotiation of a community benefit agreement. So there's some procedural and process things, um, but the uh, what, what those resources can be spent on is entirely up to the developer and the mayor. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, the Q&A. We've had some questions already answered in the Q&A section um, and good conversation going in the chat. If you have a question um, that you would like to ask live, we do encourage you to do so, so that other folks can hear it and benefit from the answer as well. Um, in order to do that, you have to raise your hand, uh, which is a feature that is available um, potentially under the more section, or it may be under your, uh, um, yes, it should be under the more option of your Zoom controls. And I will be able to see that and elevate you so that you can ask your question live. If you are interested, uh, we do have someone and I'm going to allow you to talk. You are going to have to unmute yourself. Uh, there you go. All right, go ahead. How are the credits utilized since they're not readily available? How are the tax? How are the tax credits uh, realized? So utilized. Uh, util uh, okay. So the tax credits are will be awarded. That means that uh, the the awardee. Um, can expect you know to receive one tenth of the tax credit award each year, beginning with um, you know when the building is ready to be occupied and leased up. Uh, with that award uh, commitment in hand, uh, the applicant can go to a purchaser, and there are syndicators, or insurance companies, or uh, you know uh, banks that would purchase the purchase them, um, and that is you know that you know that's something that we expect the uh, the development applicant to be, you know, that that's that's what they do. Uh, that's what you all do. But the, um, with the award, you can go to anyone. Or you can go to a, a broker of uh, who who can match the holder of of uh, those tax credit awards to a buyer, and then negotiate the terms of of however it is that you know together you want to monetize them. That's that's. Short and abstract answer. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, and if anybody else has a question, go ahead and raise your hand at this time. Um, and if I can ask you, I'm going to go to Derek first. Um, and if you can please identify yourself and where you're calling from, if you've got a company, um, a development um, in process where you're interested um, in potentially developing, any of those details are really helpful at the start as well. So Derek, you should be allowed to talk at this point. Um, you are gonna have to unmute yourself, go ahead. Yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my question is, so I have a project, well, first of all, my name is Derek Wilson, uh, name of my company is 3MN Holding Group. Um, and we have a project in downtown Trenton. Um, so we're looking to develop this particular building it's going to be mixed use. Um, the The problem is, it's only you know. So we're we're trying to go up another four stories um, in the city. So we're going through zoning now for that approval. Um, but we're looking to do um, fifteen apartments, two floors of retail space, and a roof garden component. Now, I'm looking at whether it's residential. You're saying you have to have a, a minimum of a thousand units. That's and, for the and that's for the transformative program, not the regular Aspire program. So in Trenton, the oh, minimum okay. in, in Trenton, the minimum project cost is going to be five million dollars. Um, I mean, it sounds like you're going to be close to that. Uh, not, I'm not sure entirely, but 
but that's the, that'll be the minimum the minimum project size for a residential project in Trenton. Okay, so five million, and you guys you guys are willing to match. Well, you're going to provide fifty percent of the funding for that particular project. Uh, we can. So it sounds like it's a residential project with a retail component. But it sounds like it's mostly residential. Is that right? Um, so no, let's say it's probably on the retail component. Well, yeah, let's say it's 50, 50. So the first thing we need to do is kind of determine whether it's a predominantly residential or predominantly retail program. If it's, if it is a, if it is a residential project, um, the $5 million minimum is really, that's what we'll be looking at. If it is a predominantly commercial project, then it's going to have to be a minimum of 100,000 square feet. So uh, that's something you're going to need to look at carefully as to whether it qualifies or not. Okay. But, okay. Then, but, but then the point would be, uh, if it's a commercial project, we could provide up to 50% of the project costs in tax credit awards. Um, and if it is a residential project, it would, you know, the, the, it would be a minimum of 45% and it could be potentially higher depending on other aspects of your project. Okay. Thank you. You bet. And we're happy to consult as well. So reach out with us because uh, it sounds like it's, you might be need, need some, some interpretation. Yes. Thank you, Derek, very much. We're Thank going you. to move on to William. William Henderson, you should be able to unmute. Please let us know your name and where you're calling from. Hi, um, David Henderson, uh, Trenton, New Jersey. I'm uh, with HX2 Development. We did the Roebling Lofts project in Trenton, and we are currently working on another phase of about another 100 residential units um, that will include a little commercial amenity, like a microbrewery as well. Um, my question is on labor labor rates. Um, in reading the legislation, I was confused. Is is the requirement um, prevailing wages as has been in the past for construction, or is there a PLA required as well? The PLA, uh, no, it's not a PLA. It's it's just prevailing wage um, for the construction, and then prevailing wage as well for building services that will be purchased over the light over the 10 years of the eligibility period but a pla is not required um there is okay. a there is there, there's reference in the in the statute to a labor harmony agreement but it does it's very special situations that that would apply and uh, i don't believe it would apply in the situation you're describing and for building management um so i, I remember it in this might have i don't know maybe the legislation ended up more clearly but at one point things like janitorial were required prevailing rates, but things like technical services, like HVAC maintenance did not. Did that get adjusted? Um, just want to understand clearly what kinds of things require that. That is a credit, that becomes a, a, a credit buyer risk, right? Because that gets evaluated annually and that, you know, that is, no one wants to be very clear about it. Uh, that is correct. Um, I do not recall from the rules those carve outs. Um, all the conversations that we have been, we've had have been about distinguishing the kinds of um, maintenance work that is part of a tenant's obligations and what a tenant uh, spends money on as opposed to what the developer spends money on for maintenance of the building as a whole. So uh, it, that's, that's the, this distinction, not the type of labor. Um, the only car, the only carve-outs would be for labor that just simply isn't subject to to, to um, prevailing wage um, labor rules. So, so the the tenant cleaning their space, say a retail tenant cleaning their space or operating their space, that's not covered. But the landlord, say, doing building maintenance of any sort, that is covered. That's that's the right. line. I guess. Cor correct. With, with one exception, which is that if the tenant owns more than 50% or occupies more than 50% of the building, then all of the tenants' uh, 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 maintenance work also has to be prevailing wage. Right. Okay. And this applies residential projects, 
mixed use project, commercial project, irrespect to use. It's Correct. The same rules. Great. Yeah. It's just you're much more like you're much more likely to trigger the fifty five percent of your of a, of a retail or commercial tenant than than in residential. Right. Yeah. You'd never trigger it in residential. <laughs> well, you, you might have one special tenant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else? Uh, Dave, you said? David, um, okay. that was it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. I'm going to mute you again and go to Roland Pot. Please introduce yourself and tell us where we are calling. You are calling from. Hi, Roland Pot from Trenton Makes Inc. Also a developer in downtown Trenton. Also work as a broker as well. I wanted to ask um, about the slide that said that um, for municipalities with a population of less than 200,000, the project would have to be minimum of $10 million. Um, right. Did I, so if I'm reading that correctly, Trenton being given a, that it has a population of about 90,000 um, for a Aspire project, would 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 have to be a ten million dollar plus project. Is, is that correct? Uh, well, that'd be correct, except for there is a carve out for projects that are in a qualified in investment incentive tract or a GRM. So, if you are in a QIT or a GRM, the minimum project size is five million dollars. Um, any other place that is less than two hundred thousand population um, and is not a GRM or is not a qualified incentive tract it is a $10 million limit. Okay, great. And the the um, the mapping tool will specify the QIT and GRM tracks that, as well? That's yeah. correct, yeah. Just, Diana? Just, just for clarification, Trenton is a GRM, so you're, it, it would be $5 million. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the, appreciate the response. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Roland. Um, and we do have another couple questions coming in. Arnold Davidson, um, you should now have the ability to talk and mute yourself and identify yourself, please. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, my name is Arnold Davion. I'm uh, Davion Properties ACD, located in North Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, later today, I will be incorporating my LLC. But my, my question is... I want to build a sports complex here in North Brunswick, which is actually going to be next to a, a planned brand new train station in North Brunswick on Route 1, which is a part of the former Johnson & Johnson property. Is that, a, is that a possibility of something I could uh, proceed through NJEDA? Um, it is, so I need to take a look at that. I think that it will be, uh, so the first thing is I'd have to, I, I, I'm not going to shoot from the hip. Um, so, uh, I'd, I'd want to consult with the map myself just to take, to make sure it's in the geographic eligibility area. It is, it, if it were within a half mile of an existing rail station, I would be confident it is a planned future rail station, so I'm not certain that it qualifies. Um, the other the other point is, I mean, uh, it's it's not at a GRM, so I think I'm going to give priority to the GRM questions today. But happy to follow up with you separately. The I mean, the, the other thing I would say about your question is, um, is it a is it a commercial enterprise? Is it would be it's something that would be. Uh, uh, developed on a for-profit basis by, you know, a developer and you'd have, you know, a profit motive and, 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 and concern, you know, and, and, and rate of return that you could forecast? Uh, yes. It, yes, okay. it would be. That's, 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 that's the, uh, uh, that's the plan. All right. Well then, um, we would, the, the one thing I will say about a sports complex that is a little bit challenging for us and, uh, all, I'm, all I really say here is that, um, you know, we need to be thinking about, you know, our, the, the rules are written in terms of square footage of development. So square feet of retail, square feet of office, square feet of warehouse, you know, restaurant, hotel, et cetera. Like that's very clear for those kinds of uses. For a sports complex, trying to figure out what a square foot is is a little bit different because, you know, 
building a ball field is not the same. Even if it's revenue generating, it's not quite the same. So we need to give some thought to that. And, I'm, and you know, so my overall response to you is going to be, um, it's possible. I'm not going to rule it out, but I'm not confident. Okay. All right. That's good enough for now. Uh, so now who, okay, can you tell me at least who would I contact? Uh, you can contact that possibility. You can contact me, or you can get access to anyone in the uh, the Aspire program by just sending an email to aspire at njeda dot com. Okay, we will excellent. redistribute that. Much. Yeah, his contact information for both Nat and Diana is in the chat, and we'll periodically put that back in as well to make sure. That's, okay. Um, okay. Well, thank you. Mind. You bet. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on to Lauren Moore. You should have the ability to talk. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, Lauren Moore. I'm with the Atlantic County Economic Alliance. We're here in the Atlantic County, uh, Lang City Airport Aviation District. Um, I have a couple questions here. I wonder, hopefully Nate um, can talk about what taxes do you have to generate um, to qualify uh, for the program? And is it uh, an incremental tax increase uh, on the project. And then two, I'd like to hear a little bit about, you know, the but for test. Uh, this is a gap financing uh, program is the way I understand it. And how do you conduct your, your gap analysis on the project? So it's kind of a two part question. The taxes that you have to generate, which taxes are eligible? And how do you conduct your gap analysis, the but for test? Sure. Okay, so the, um, great question, and thank you for raising it. So uh, and it's not in the slides, and it is actually one more of the uh, the areas where there is um, that the program has been structured to uh, give a bonus to development in GRMs compared to other locations. Um, so the test we have basically is that for uh, for the program overall, this is for every dollar of tax credit that's issued, the project needs to generate. A uh, dollar eighty-five of new uh, tax revenue to the state. Uh, so uh, that's you know that's the that's the way we're looking at it, and we're looking at the tax revenue that is generated in the state as a result of the direct, indirect, and induced impacts of project construction. And then the other component is over the ten years of the eligibility period when we're issuing tax credits uh, to the project, um, the uh, corporate business income tax and employment taxes, you know, payroll taxes to the state. So we're not looking at taxes that are collected at the local level uh, with one exception, which is that if new taxes at the local level end up reducing uh, the, the fiscal uh, responsibility of the state to pay for uh, services at the local level. In that case, it would be a benefit. The reduction, but an increase in local taxes would be treated as a benefit to the state. Uh, the benefit test is not required to be uh, performed for uh, residential projects. Uh, and the test, I'm sorry if I've forgotten what I just said, but the test for government restricted municipalities is lower than it is for everywhere else. So whereas it's $1.85 in return to the state for every dollar of tax credit issued, uh, in most places, in GRMs, it's a dollar fifty in tax returns to the state uh, for every dollar that's issued. So this, the test is less stringent uh, for commercial projects in GRMs. Uh, your question, your next question, was about what kinds of taxes, um, and it is. Uh, gosh, well, it's the taxes I just mentioned, corporate, corporate business income and payroll taxes. Um, and there may be others as well, but um, just what is it? It's the distinction is between taxes that are generated to the local level and taxes at the state level. Uh, what I'll tell you just a couple other things about that, just so you know uh, how, we're, how we're doing this. When we measure the benefit to the state, we're using uh, a tool called the IMPLAN model, I-M-P-L-A-N. It is an, a publicly available uh, impact modeling, economic impact modeling tool. Um, we go to uh, a data source that is provided by the Energy Information Administration at the federal level to tell us how many employees are likely to be um, housed at 
any different development based on what kind of development it is. So if it's, you know, office or, you know, warehouse and distribution or light industrial or, or a hotel, we're going to get from this uh, publicly available data source uh, information on employment density. And then the implant tool has information in it about the average wages of those um, of those employees. And so we use the implant model to forecast what the uh, the sort of the wage bill will be for um, likely tenants of the space that is built. We are not going to be entertaining um, sort of bespoke uh, impact measurement proposals from developers based on the tenants that they anticipate. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one is that we don't want to, you know, we, we don't want applicants to be kind of putting a finger on the scales when they come to us uh, in terms of forecasting what the benefits of these are going to be to, to, to qualify. The other thing is we also want to relieve them of a administrative burden to document every year over the life of the project who exactly is employed on site um, you know, how many people and what their wages are. Uh, that's really kind of a headache and a relationship with a tenant that I think a, a, a landlord doesn't really want. And the other thing is it also um, subjects the applicant to risk that the, uh, that the numbers in future years are not exactly what were advertised at the outset and were, that are the basis of the award. So it's, a, it's an attempt to reduce the administrative burden and reduce uh, risk to the applicant. So... Uh, I, I've said a lot of words in response to your question. I, I, I hope those were the right ones uh, or, you, use, or useful ones. Yeah. Can you still hear me, Nick? So um, in particular, I was interested in hotel taxes. Um, if hotel taxes, we have an airport hotel project that's approved, uh, you know, here, and uh, they do have a gap issue. So when I asked about the gap in the past program with ERG, it was a, you had to have at least a 20% gap in your financial stack, uh, I didn't hear if there's a partic particular size in the gap that you're required to have. And then right. two, the EARN program had a list of specific taxes that were eligible for right. you know tax credits back. So okay. hotel taxes are on my mind. Yeah, okay, got it. Great question. And uh, I, I, thank you for raising it because it's important a very important difference between the ERG program and the uh, Aspire program. So with the ERG program, one of the reasons that those specific taxes were listed because the uh, tax credit to the developer was generated out of the actual measured taxes that were generated by the project. And so it's very clearly specified which taxes uh, are, you know, will be counted for that purpose. Um, and the developer was sort of at risk for how much was generated. So, you know, if you, you have a retail project and, you know, it's, it does not have the robust sales that were forecast at the outset, then the tax credit award could be at risk and less. In this case, um, we give a tax credit award up front in a certain amount. Um, so it's not dependent on the actual tax levels, you know, the tax taxes that are generated. As far as the gap question that you mentioned, so the way we look at a, a project, a commercial project that's going to be, um, we're going to, uh, our, our consultant uh, and advisor, Jones Lang LaSalle, uh, helped us develop a tool that allows us to estimate what, what the reasonable and appropriate rate of return should be for a commercial project based on its location, based on the type of project that it is, uh, the riskiness of the, you know, and the strength of the economy around it. Historically, those rates of return have averaged, you know, have ranged between 11% and 19%. And we're looking at, you know, basically an, an IRR, uh, for the applicant entity based on the equity uh, contribution made and the returns to that entity. Um, and the way we look at the gap is if you, without the Aspire Award, um, you are below that target rate of return. So say you're at a 2% you know, or a 3% rate of return and our model says that you know, this type of project in this kind of place should have a rate of return of 15%, then we size the tax credit award to get the project from its modeled return, you know, below market, unmotivating rate of return up to what it needs to be to motivate uh, private investment. So that's how we look, that's 
basically how we look at the gap. Um, there was something else that I wanted to say about that, but I forgot. So I'm gonna either let you ask the either you I'll let you ask the follow up or somebody else. You know, but that's interesting, Nate. That its tax credits are issued um, up front. I heard and are not dependent on the tax generation of the site, which takes the project developer project sponsor out of the business of having to certify year on year uh, with the Department of Treasury uh, whether or not they generated the required tax revenue. This is all based off of Jones Lang LaSalle model well, based on the project uh, financial dynamics. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Okay. There's none of that exp there's not a, there's not the exp there, there, don't get don't get me wrong. There's gonna be a lot of checking on the project performance, you know, over the life of the over the project, but that particular one is removed. Yeah. That's a significant change, of course, from the ERG program. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um we do have about five minutes, five or six minutes left. Um Cornelius Crawford is up next. If you can identify yourself and where you're calling from, Cornelius, please. Cornelius, are you there, Cornelius? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. There we go. Okay, wonderful. We can hear you. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, no, I just wanted to Cornelius Crawford, Crawford Customs LLC. Um, just in general, I have several projects in Trenton, New Jersey, and I. It's pretty much the same question that folks were asking before. It seems like there is a five million dollar limit on those projects, does it matter if we combine it for, um, our projects are a little bit lower scale, they're about $2 million each. Um, so if we combine three different addresses um, for a project to be able to be available for funding, does that work as well? And is there any sort of time frame uh, with the projects um, underneath your program? So the first one is, it. It is possible that separate projects would be included, but there really has to be kind of a, um, you know, there needs to be kind of a, some kind of functional connection between the two. They need to have, uh, you know, be subject to the same financing. Um, you know, it, it, that's, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that we can't, again, like other things, can't rule it out. It's, there are hard, there are steeper tests to meet to demonstrate that it is really a single project, which is really what we would need to do to to fit it into the eligibility. Um, so, you know, if they're if they're separate if they're separate you know parcels that are adjacent to one another, that's one thing. Uh, if they're physically separated and they're going to have separate financings and separate certificates of occupancy related, it, 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 it's probably going to be a, a lot harder to maybe impossible. Got it. Oh, it's, uh, and you had a separate question? Um, uh, well, pretty much it would just be in different phases, I assume. It's, they're all mixed-use projects. They all have, you know, um, about 70% 70, 70 residential and 30% uh, commercial on them as well. And we kind of treat it as different phases. But yes, they're uh, within, I guess, two blocks of one another. So I was trying to see if that could be something that could be combined, uh, but very similar. Uh, you know, all of them are similar projects. Uh, I'm I'm just going to venture that you know based on based on that first description I think the hurdle is going to be too high. Uh, again, I'm willing to talk about it, look at it. You know, feel free to follow up and and share with us a little bit more in specifics about the projects. And I'm happy to kind of give a little bit you know more definitive view after that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Oh, you're muted, Caitlin. Ah, the dreaded mute button. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelius. <laughs> um, we do have a couple more questions. Um, I don't believe Derek Wilson, I don't believe he uh, got a chance to ask his question previously. So we're going to jump. Oh, no, Derek did, did, did go before. Okay. Yeah. So, Sumai, go ahead and uh, you can speak and ask your question. Hello. How you doing? My name is Sumai Sabah. Yeah. One more time, Sumai. Hmm. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there we go. Hmm. Sumai Sababu, Sababu Capital, Trenton, New Jersey. 
How's a residential project analyzed since there's no cost benefit analysis? Uh, the, so great question. Um, it's just, it's simply not subject to that, to that test. We look at the gap financing and we look, uh, you know, uh, it, de it depends, you know, it, it, a lot depends on, um, uh, you know, whether it's being developed on a commercial model or as, with a def deferred development fee and an earned fee model, according to, you know, and it's sort of an HMFA process around you know, a project that's got low income housing tax credits. Um, but we're basically doing, you know, looking at the returns um, and looking at what tax credit award amount is necessary to bring the returns up to, um, you know, a feasible level if it's being done on a commercial basis and to kind of conform with the HMFA project economic rules if it's being done on that basis. Okay, and what's the maximum fee a developer can collect? Uh, well, it is, that's determined by HMFA if it's a low-income housing tax credit. If it's residential, again, we're going to be looking to the jones lang saw model that we use to, to, uh, to kind of assess that. And as I said, historically, it's ranged between 11 and 19%. Uh, you know, the, the, the riskier it is, the higher the rate of return, uh, the, the, the less risky, the more stable kind of an operating environment it's in, the lower the rate of return. But, you know, that's something we'd have a conversation about. Okay, thank you. You bet. Looks like we do have two more um, return questioners. We are just at about noon. Um, if we can steal another couple minutes of, of, our, of our presenters' times, we'll go to these guys um, and then close it off. You can always submit additional questions um, directly to Nate, Anat, and Diana. Excuse me, Nate, Anat, and Diana. <laughs> Thank you. I'll um, still answer. <laughs> he'll still answer to Nate, but his name is Nat. <laughs> um, and to the general aspire at mgjeda.com email as well. So I am going to go back to William Henderson. Go ahead if you can make it quick and be just be uh, courteous of time, aware of time. Yes. Um, the project I were embarking on is subject to a redeveloper agreement with Mercer County Improvement Authority. Does that waive the community benefits um, process? Um, the statute has, uh, and the rules include language that uh, allows for it to satisfy the CBA requirement. Um, there is some, uh, there's some tensions in the language there. And there's also kind of a question whether you would actually want to forego the community benefit agreement requirement because it does also bring added resources to the table. So, um, you know, uh, happy to follow up with you about the specifics in the project, but I mean, um, you know, if you've got a $40 million project, a dollar project and, you know, you can get $5 million in tax credit award for to support a community benefit agreement, you know, uh, honestly, if you've taken care of all the economics already under the, the redevelopment agreement and you could get more, I, I don't really know why you want to leave that on the table, but, uh, Happy to talk about it subsequently. Great, thanks. You bet. Wonderful. All right, and then we're going to go back to Derek real, real quick for our last question. Derek, you should be able to talk. Yes, this should be real quick. Um, so I want to circle back about the uh, prevailing rate uh, component to the uh, tax credits. Um, so if you're looking at a multi-floor building that needs an elevator, we're talking about CAM, right? We're talking about common area maintenance. So that prevailing rate component, does that trigger whether you do that, whether you perform those duties in-house or you farm them out? Yeah, if it's your employee, it, the employee needs to be paid a prevailing wage. If you if you farm it out, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. Okay. You bet. Thank you. Um, and thank you to. Nat and Diana for their participation today, all of this wealth of information. Thank, for, thank you for joining us today, and all of the great conversations and questions. Um, this will be submitted um, online. You'll be able to um, view it, view the recording in the next day or two. There, if you have questions, email addresses are on the screen that, um, that may pop up and we're gonna let you go and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care.